Amen, brothers and sisters. Well, if you would, go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And we will be in the last section this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 17. And we will finish the epistle this morning. Hear the word of the living God. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future." so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. Let's pray one more time. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness as we have studied 1 Timothy Lord, help us this morning to see, uh, again, the glory of God in Christ uh, and help us, Lord, as we see these instructions on how to handle uh, the, the wealth and the possessions that you have entrusted to some. Lord, we pray that you would bind every, uh, everything that would come against our thinking in a, in a sinful or ungodly way and that you would open our minds to hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Well, by God's grace, we have come to these last few verses in Paul's first epistle to Timothy. And I pray and I hope that this study of 1 Timothy has been encouraging and a blessing to you. You know, our motive for studying 1 Timothy uh, to begin with was that we thought it was just necessary to just land ourselves back in the apostolic framework for the local church. Um, uh, you know, we in years past, we've taught on ecclesiology, the study of the church. We've taught on elders and church discipline, and we've taught on all of these things uh, that have come up in First Timothy. However, when we moved into this building a couple of years ago, uh, and since the church has added new members from a lot of different traditions and a lot of new backgrounds, uh, we really just thought it was wise to just go back to the basics and ask the very fundamental questions, what does God say about His church? And I hope that we have seen a lot of light on these matters and a lot of light on the Christian life as a whole. And in many ways, last week's passage seemed like the conclusion to the letter. Uh, you remember, after Paul warns Timothy about greed and those who love money, he turns his, atten his attention back to Timothy and exhorts him personally. And you remember, he says, fight the good fight of the faith. And he charges him in the presence of God and in the presence of Christ Jesus to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of the Lord. And then Paul gives this sort of benediction uh, where he lists all these attributes of God and then he just erupts into doxology where he says to Him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. And it seems to be the perfect place uh, for Paul then to give that final salutation that we see in verses 20 and 21 where he says, O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. And he says, grace be to you or with you. Uh, these are themes that we've seen many times in our study of 1 Timothy. And it seems like that would be a normal way to end the letter. Uh, but Paul, however, does not end the letter that way. Uh, he turns his attention again to another group that, Paul, or that Timothy is called to instruct. And Paul calls this group the rich in this present age. Verse 17. The rich in this present age. And so Paul has given Timothy uh, instructions on how to deal with false teachers. 
and he's given him instructions uh, regarding men's and women's roles in uh, public worship. He's given instructions regarding elders and deacons and how to deal with widows and all of these things. And now he's giving Timothy instructions on how to instruct the rich, the rich in this present age. And now it's worth pointing out, Paul doesn't build out what he means by rich. Uh, He doesn't give uh, commentary on how the people got their riches. Uh, He doesn't give commentary on whether they worked hard to gain those riches, uh, on whether those riches were an inheritance from their parents. He doesn't get into whether they got the riches before they came to Christ or after they came to Christ. He doesn't give us uh, any commentary on those things. Uh, Nevertheless, he does acknowledge that there will be Christians in the local church whom God has entrusted to have wealth and an abundance of possessions. There are, according to Paul, Christians in the church of Ephesus whom he considers to be rich. Uh, There are some who have an abundance of material possessions and who are currently in no place of need. And you can imagine how these people at Ephesus would have felt upon hearing the, the letter read publicly. And I think there's good evidence that this letter uh, was to be read publicly. And I say that because the very last uh, line, grace be with you, uh, the you there is plural. It's not singular. So that shows us that Paul uh, is writing to Timothy, but he, uh, he intends that this letter be read publicly to the church at Ephesus. And you can imagine how they would have felt after hearing Paul uh, give the warnings about greed and about those who love money from back in verses 9 and 10. Let me read those for us again. Uh, He says, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And he says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. And it is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many uh, pangs. And so if you have riches and you're hearing Paul say that, you're probably wondering, what about me? Uh, I mean, am I doomed? Uh, Am I cut off? Am I given over to the love of money? Do I have everything I have because of greed? Do I need to give all of my possessions away and make myself not rich? They would have been asking these questions. And so Paul addresses the rich Christians. And I think we should just go ahead and say it. Uh, This section of the letter is applicable to all of us in this room. Uh, Again, Pastor John Mark uh, talked about this a couple of weeks ago, and he gave a lot of statistics that I won't repeat again this morning. But guys, when we compare uh, our possessions and the access that we have to what we need, and, and, and we compare that to the rest of the world, and when we compare that to most people throughout history, we simply have to acknowledge that in a general sense at least, we could all be considered rich in this present age. You know, think about it. Uh, if having food and clothing, verse 8, is the standard for having our needs met, then almost all of us, are way out in front of the standard. I I mean, I don't want to assume everyone's experience in here, but statistically speaking, most of us in this room do not even have a category for not having food and clothing in abundance. We, We don't even have a category for not having our basic needs met in abundance every single day. It's just the air that we breathe. Uh, But but going beyond that, even if we were to think about riches by today's standards in America, it's just a reality that some Christians in the local church will have an abundance of possessions. And and they will have an access to a kind of lifestyle that not every other Christian in the local church has. That's just reality. And Paul gives us instructions on how to think about it. This passage is full of practical yet profound wisdom for those to whom God has entrusted with an abundance of material 
uh, possessions. And in many ways, this is a text that deals with what we call stewardship. And so before we jump into this text, I want to give us a couple of cautions. Uh, number one, you know, it, it may be tempting for some of us to say, well, I know what's in my bank account, and I don't think I'm rich. So this must not be for me. It must be for everybody else. Uh, and, and again, uh, it may be also tempting to kind of look around and highlight the people that we think are rich. Let's, let's not do that. Uh, let's be mature. Uh, let's be able to receive the Word of God as for what it is, the Word of God. And so whether we're talking about marriage or parenting or riches or soldiers or pastors or deacons or, or whatever category we're talking about, this is God's Word for the people of God. And we need to be mature enough to receive it and hear it as the Word of God and not just check out because we don't think it applies to us. And then secondly, another caution that I want to give us is that we shouldn't too quickly dismiss the fact that Paul says riches. Right? Uh, you know, somewhat, somebody may come to this text, maybe they have a background in biblical counseling or something, and they could say, well, the text says riches, but you could really replace riches with whatever uh, idol you want, and the, and, the, and the practical application would be the same. You know, we could, we could just say replace riches with comfort or ease or fame or safety or sex or, or whatever it is, and all the principles would apply. And I agree with that on a functional level, uh, but Paul specifically addresses the rich. And he specifically addresses riches. And so let's take God's Word for what it is. Let's hear what the Spirit is saying. And then we can make those types of apl applications in an appropriate setting. And, and so what I want to do this morning is I want to ask three questions uh, uh, regarding wealthy Christians and their possessions. And then I want to seek to answer them from this passage and, and cross over into some other portions of Scripture as well. So those three questions are in your bulletin. Uh, how should wealthy Christians view themselves? How should wealthy Christians view their wealth? And what should wealthy Christians do with their wealth? Number one, how should wealthy Christians view themselves? Verse 17, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. Charge them not to be haughty. And while we certainly do not have time this morning to do a biblical theology of wealth, it's worth mentioning that the Bible's whole treatment on the issue of money is rather robust. It's just not a simple issue. You know, if we were to ask, you know, what does the whole Bible say about sexuality? Or what does the whole Bible say about the exclusivity of Christ for salvation? Or what does the whole Bible, what does the whole Bible say about telling the truth? We could, we could answer that question in a pretty simple one or two sentence answer uh, that's very simple, uh, and we could give a holistic summary very quickly. But when we ask the question, what does the whole Bible say about money? The answer is just not that simple. It gets rather complex. You know, at one level, wealth is a great sign of blessing from God. You think about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the possessions that they received and, and built up. Uh, you think about David and Solomon and all the gold and all the wealth of the temple. And, and you think about the Proverbs and, and the positive things that the Proverbs say about building wealth and saving and working hard. And then you get to the New Testament and, and there's good reason to believe that even Jesus and Paul had wealthier Christians uh, who, would, who would benefit them and support their ministries, and they did not rebuke them or condemn them or think that that was wrong. And yet, at another level, the Bible gives us incredibly strong warnings about the dangers of loving money and putting our hope and our hearts on treasure. Uh, the passage we studied a couple weeks ago, again, uh, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. And if that text is about Judas, we need to stop and say, 
That's amazing that the man who betrayed the Son of God did it because he loved money. That should at least cause us to, to pause and examine ourselves. Uh, the third group of people in the parable of the sower who are sown among the thorns, Jesus says, they are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. And then in Mark 10, 25, Jesus says, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And I will say more about that verse in a moment. But it's important for us to acknowledge that the Bible has a lot to say about money and possessions and treasures from a lot of different angles. And then you get into the, the teaching of the heart. And you think about how all this is a heart issue. And then you think about the current culture and the political climate that one is in. This just isn't simplistic to deal with this topic. And we don't need to treat it as if it is simplistic. But again, uh, Paul does not get down into the weeds of all of that. Uh, he doesn't talk about what the whole Bible thinks about riches, and therefore I won't try to do that this morning either. Uh, he simply says to Timothy in verse 17, charge them not to be haughty. Uh, and that's familiar, isn't it? Uh, I mean, we've seen uh, Paul telling Timothy to charge people Throughout the letter in chapter one, Paul urged Timothy to remain in Ephesus. Why? So that he may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. Paul charges Timothy to keep his instructions on dealing with elders without showing partiality. He charges Timothy to keep the commandment free from stain and above reproach. These charges show an urgency and a seriousness in Paul's thinking. They deal with very important matters in terms of Paul's thinking on keeping the church pure and on keeping Christians healthy and keeping them in the faith. And so we must conclude from that that Paul sees it as vitally uh, important that the rich Christians in Ephesus not be haughty. The New American Standard Bible says uh, conceited. The King James translates it high-minded. The wealthy Christians in the church must not, because of their wealth, view themselves as if God loves them more than everybody else that has less wealth. Uh, they must not say, look, look at me and how awesome I am. Look how awesome I've been for myself. If everybody else did it the way I did it, they would have wealth. They must ha not have these kinds of mindsets. They must not think that their wealth by default gives them positions of authority in the church. And Paul is warning against this kind of thinking. And now we can obviously go way off the rails with this like some in the modern social, social justice uh, movement have done. And we could say things like, you know, if you're wealthy, the only really moral response is just for you to acknowledge that you're privileged. You don't say you earned that. Don't say you worked hard. Don't say you showed up on time. You're privileged. And the only thing you should do is acknowledge that and then give your wealth away to those who aren't privileged so that there's equity and equality. And I trust that we would all call that absolutely unbiblical. Proverbs 13.11 says, Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. It's positive. Proverbs 13.22, A good man... Not a privileged man. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Proverbs 12.11 Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread. But he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. So clearly there are biblical principles that speak positively about wealth building. They are in God's Word. But what the wealthy must guard against is having a heart posture of arrogance because of their wealth. And instead, they must cultivate a heart posture of humility. And so how does a wealthy Christian do this? Well, first and foremost, they recognize that everything they have is from God. Everything they have is from God. Uh, the possessions themselves are from God. The, the, the work ethic that produced the wealth 
is from God. Uh, The good things that our parents taught us with regard to working hard and showing up on time, and those are from God. Those are gifts and graces from God. Our jobs are from God. We see everything from our Heavenly Father. And so there's nothing to boast about or be arrogant about. These things are a blessing. He goes on to verse in verse 17 to say that it is God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. James 1.17 Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So everything good is from God, from the Father of lights. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Paul is saying it's, it's, it's insanity to boast about your gifts and your graces as if God didn't give you those by His Spirit. And how much more the material possessions that God has given us. Romans 12, 3, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. And when we have this kind of attitude of humility that says God in his perfect plan for my life has chosen to supply me with an abundance of possessions to use for His glory, I I am no better than anyone else. And and if that's not God's plot for your life and His will for your life, you rejoice. God God has entrusted to others possessions and wealth and material abundance to use for His glory. I'll rejoice in that. He's given me gifts. He's given that brother or sister gifts. We rejoice in the abundance of diversity of gifts that God has given. And the wealthy Christian should come to these things and say, you know, I need the same saving grace through faith that everyone else needs. I I am no better. I have the same Spirit indwelling me as every other believer. I'm not special in God's eyes. And we will find... If we think this way, we will actually be much more thankful about our possessions and we will cling to them much more loosely because we will see that they're not mine anyway. They're God's. And He's given them to me to use for His kingdom. He said, I brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out. So brothers and sisters, if God has blessed you with wealth, seek Him. Seek Him for His grace to cultivate a humble, lowly-minded heart posture knowing that you need the same mercy and grace as every other Christian, even the poorest Christians on the planet, and use that wealth for His kingdom's advancement. Number two, how should wealthy Christians view their wealth? Is it evil? He says in the second half of verse 17, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. And so again, Paul doesn't give us a whole commentary on his apostolic view of riches. However, what is clear from this verse is that wealthy Christians must not view their wealth as an object of trust and hope. An object upon which to rest their hope. And let's just be honest. Isn't it easy to do that? It is. Uh, Wealthy Christians should certainly be familiar with all the warnings in Scripture about greed and the love of money and the deceitfulness of riches. And, And I am not advocating that anyone should feel guilty over having wealth. You should only feel guilty when you sin against God. We shouldn't feel guilty. We should praise. We should thank. But we should acknowledge that the possible danger is there to turn a good gift into an object of trust and to hope in it and to cling to it as if it can actually protect us and actually deliver us. And I am not 
saying either that there is a direct one-to-one correlation uh, between having wealth and loving money, uh, or being wealthy and being greedy. There's not a one-to-one correlation there. Uh, There are people whose hearts are full of greed and full of the love of money and full of hoping and trusting in money who have very little, if anything, to their name. And, And likewise, I know Christians who are very wealthy, who are some of the godliest people I know, Because they are humble and they use their good gifts to serve the body of Christ and to advance the kingdom of God and they support missionaries and they and they they use their wealth for good. And so there's not a one to one correlation there, but we must be on guard at the end of the day. The heart is the issue. The heart is the issue, not poverty or riches. Uh, However, when the Bible screams at us about a particular issue, we should stop and listen. Amen? We should stop and we should listen. We should examine ourselves and take heed. God knows us a lot better than we know ourselves. He knows what we're prone to. He, He knows the danger that we are in if we don't think rightly about a certain topic, about a certain issue. He He knows what we're capable of even when we don't see it about ourselves. And I would argue that the Bible, particularly in the New Testament, does scream at us, metaphorically speaking, about the dangers of wealth and riches. I mean, sit down one day or one week and read the Gospel of Luke in in a week and just, just plow your way through it and you will see what I'm talking about. Jesus is giving warning after warning after warning about loving and trusting in money. And therefore... Uh, I submit to you that we should acknowledge how tempting it is to trust riches rather than God. And we should acknowledge how tempting it is to be focused on storing up treasures in this life and neglect to think about the life to come. And we should acknowledge that there are aspects of depending on God that we may never get the, uh, the privilege of experiencing Because we just don't simply have to rely on Him the way others do. And the way others have throughout history. I mean, you think about the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Uh, There there were people, uh, there still are today, but there there were Christians in the first century that that was a reality to them. They had to rely every day on God to give them their bread. I mean, it's hard for us to even comprehend that. But think about the blessing that comes and the sweetness that, that you develop on, in depending upon God to that level. I mean, it's like being in a trial. Uh, we, I don't think we should wish suffering on ourselves or actually want to be in trials or go pursue trials. But isn't there a sweetness that those who suffer experience about God? that those who are not in those difficult seasons just just struggle to comprehend. These are realities, and we should acknowledge them. After the rich young ruler goes away sad, after Jesus tells him to guard or to go and sell his possessions and give the money to the poor and to come follow him, Jesus says to his disciples in Mark 10, 23-25, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at His words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. You know, have you ever really contemplated that passage? Have you ever really thought about it? Why does Jesus stress that it is so difficult for a rich person to go to heaven. I mean, it's not that they're inherently more sinful, that they need more than the gospel to be saved. Surely not. That's not what Jesus is saying. There's a lot that could be said here, I'm sure. But think about this. Wealth provides access to what people deem to be most important. Our food, our, our, our homes, our necessities. But even going beyond that, the the things that our hearts deem to be most important, our happiness, our comfort, 
our safety, our status, our fame, our entertainment. You know, wealth provides people access to get what their hearts truly long for and lust after. And wealth provides the the facade that it actually protects us and keeps us safe and, and keeps us from harm. And so what do people do? They set their hope on riches rather than on God. Because their riches provide them with what they think they need and what they cherish most. Yet, Jesus demands 99% allegiance? No. 100% allegiance. And, And He assures us that if we are not willing to forsake all to follow Him, we, sh- we cannot be His disciples. And that means crucifying and dying and forsaking the idols in our hearts. Uh, the corrupt desires that rise up and compete with Jesus for worship in our hearts. He says, you've got to forsake those. You've got to forsake those and come and follow Me. I am the only one to whom you are to give worship. And one way to identify idols in our hearts is to sit back and think, you know, what if Jesus, again, metaphorically speaking, what if Jesus commanded me to go and sell all that I had and to give to the poor and to come follow Him in in some way that we didn't think He would command us to in this life? What what if that happened? Uh, what, What desires of the heart would I be forsaking? What pleasures What dreams, what comforts would I have to give up? Uh, What what would vanish away? And how would I do with that? Would I joyfully go and follow Him? Or would I get sad like the rich young ruler and pout and walk away and prove not to be a disciple? Uh, would Would I immediately get stirred up with anxiety and overwhelming fear and worry because I actually don't trust God, I trust in my wealth. And again, it's impossible to really know our hearts uh, without being in the situation, but it is worth before God in sobriety of mind pondering these things and saying, Lord, search me. Search my heart and know me. See if there be any grievous way in me. Show me, Lord, do I trust in my wealth? Do I trust in riches? Is anything in my heart exalted itself to the place of worship so that if I lose it, I sin? And we are to forsake those beliefs. And you think about the uncertainty of the value of the dollar. I mean, we've seen this just in the last few years with inflation, right? Uh, you know, a salary that five or six years ago seemed to be on the higher end now is just what you need to get by paycheck to paycheck. Uh, This gets into things like retirement and investments, the uncertainty of the stock market and rates of return. And Paul is not saying don't do those things. He's saying don't trust in them. Don't put your hope on them. Uh, Don't trust in the uncertainty of riches that one day can be worth very much, but then later on another day be worth very little. They can't keep your heart beating. They can't keep you from getting in the car crash. They can't keep you from the terminal uh, cancer. They, They can't guarantee anything. Don't trust in them. On the contrary, set your hope on the only source of certainty. Set your hope on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. And notice the play on words there. He says, don't set your hope on the uncertainty of riches. Set your hope on God who what? Richly provides. And this is why, again, as I said last week, having right views about the attributes of God are so important for living the Christian life well. I mean, it is absolutely necessary, guys, that we know the God of the Bible and know what He is like. While the value of the dollar changes, God is immutable. He is eternal. He is unchanging. While gas prices fluctuate up and down and depend on wars and depend on who's in the office in White House and, and all of this, it's dependent on a hundred different variables. And outside of our control, God has what we call a seity. He, he is self-sufficient. He is dependent on nothing. 
God is impassable. Nothing can pass upon Him and make Him react or change. He is always in control. Never reacting. Always active. Always assertive. Never passive. He is sovereign. Sovereign. Meaning that He is totally free to do whatever He wants. Whenever He wants. And He is omnipotent. Meaning that He has the power to carry out His will and do whatever He wants. These things are vital to believe about God so that we do not run the risk of trusting in riches. And all Christians must develop these convictions and renew their mind in them. And to close this point, listen to Patrick Fairbairn commenting on these verses. He says this. He says, to trust in riches, the apostle would have it understood, is virtually to make uncertainty one's confidence. Since both their continuance with us and our possession of them may at any moment come to termination. The contrast to such an insecure foundation is God, the eternal, the all-sufficient, who ministers richly to His people's necessities and just desires, and who, as a source of enjoyment to those who trust in Him, can never fail. Number three, what should wealthy Christians do with their wealth? Verse 18, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. So wealthy Christians are not to view their wealth as an object upon which to set their hope, uh, but they are to use their wealth as means of doing good as means of being a blessing. blessing. Notice again the word play. He says the rich are not to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but are to what? To be rich in doing good. Uh, they are to focus on being rich with, they're not to focus on being rich with regard to material possessions and assets, but to be rich toward blessing the body, toward advancing the kingdom. Again, this is what we call stewardship. Using the good, the good gifts that God has given, not in selfish ways, not for selfish pursuits of pleasure, uh, not for our ambitions, but for the good of others and for the advancement of the kingdom. And he says to be generous. And that word in the original Greek language in this text or in the New Testament is only used once and it's here in the New Testament. And it literally means to be ready to give. To be liberal in giving. To give freely. The idea that wealthy is that wealthy Christians should not cling to their possessions and hold on to them so that someone has to pry them out of their hands. The idea is that they should hold them loosely. And be ready to bless, ready to use, ready to do good whenever the occasion arises. And Paul gives wealthy Christians the motivation for holding their wealth loosely and being ready to use it for good in verse 19 when he says, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. And I think it's obvious here that Paul is familiar with Jesus' teaching, uh, which is recorded in Matthew 6 and Luke 12. Matthew records it this way. Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures where? In heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I think this passage helps us make sense of what Paul means by the future and that which is truly life. He means the life to come. Uh, the eternal age, what Jesus calls heaven. And so again, look closely at the flow of thought. In verse 17, the rich in this present age are to use their present riches to store up treasure for a future age. A future life. 
the age whereby we get that which is truly life. They are not to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches. They are not to set their ultimate focus on storing up more riches. Rather, they are to use their riches as means of obtaining a, an eternal future foundation in heaven, in the eternal age. And in the major way, one major way, that wealthy Christians can store up heavenly treasure is by stewarding well temporary goods. It's incredible. <clears throat> Again, listen to the Lord Jesus in Luke 16, 9-13. He says, I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails... Notice again, uncertainty. When it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, whose is it? It's God's. Who will give you that to which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for he will, either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And we don't have time to unpack all of that, but the general point is the same. God has entrusted to some Christians temporary wealth uh, which the world loves and serves and sets their hope on, which I think is what Jesus means by unrighteous wealth, uh, but which His people are to steward for the life to come. Uh, they, are, they are to steward it well. They are to be good possessors of it. And their primary motivation on receiving uh, these things from God and using them is that they would get true riches. Eternal riches, true treasure that is not uncertain, a true foundation that will not perish or fade away in heaven. And so what are some practical ways that we can do this? We can talk about this more in city group, but here are a few. You know, maybe perhaps rather than selling something to get a few extra dollars, ask, does a brother in Christ need this? Uh, what's better, a few extra dollars or the eternal reward of blessing a brother or sister in Christ? Uh, being ready and willing to contribute to benevolence matters when they arise. Being ready and willing, asking, does anybody have need? Uh, where can I bless? Who, who, who's in need right now? Who can I serve with my possessions? Supporting missionaries. And those who need support for living. Advancing the kingdom of God in the nations. Participating in the Great Commission by sending and supporting those who take the Gospel elsewhere. And then hospitality. Having people in our homes and cooking meals for them if we are able. Uh, you know, a few years ago, when, when we were in a smaller home than we have now, we, we began to pray that the Lord would give us a bigger home because we were really unable to host city group and we were unable to have a lot of people over and we really didn't have anywhere for children to play and those kinds of things. So we just began to pray and seek the Lord. And we would say to the Lord, Lord, if, if we can use a bigger home for discipleship, if we can host city group, if we can have many people in our homes and, and have uh, worship and have children in our homes and teach children and, and do good, then Lord, give us, give us a bigger home whereby we can do these things. And it was amazing how shortly after we began to pray that, that the Lord opened a door and gave us a bigger home. And by God's grace, we we're able now to host city group and to do different things and have people over. Uh, but there are times even now when my heart rises up, my sinful uh, the fleshly aspects that I haven't crucified yet fully, rise up and say, maybe it's enough. The, the walls are going to get dinked. The floorboards are going to get scratched. Markers are going to get on the wall. Protect it. Withhold it. 
And I have to constantly remind myself, and the Lord graciously reminds me, this house isn't mine in the ultimate sense to begin with. It's the Lord's. It's the Lord's. It's a good gift from the Lord that yes, we are to enjoy. Yes, we are to steward. Yes, we are to take care of. But He has given it to us to steward for good and to share and to be hospitable. And brothers and sisters, this should excite us. I mean, it really should. There are a lot of things about the Christian life that are complex. This isn't one of them. Right? I'm not sure there's a simpler way of storing up eternal treasure than by sharing your possessions and using them to do good. But let's face it, this is harder than it seems. Not because it's complex, but because of the remaining corruption in our hearts and the remaining selfishness in our hearts. Our hearts struggle with selfishness and with fear and with covetousness. And the reality is that because of sin, it's actually a great struggle to obey these passages. And we need the Lord's help with these things. And I am grateful that the Lord Jesus laid His life down and became poor for our sakes. None of us can buy our way to heaven. None of us have the possessions and the wealth. None of us are faithful enough stewards to say, look God, look what I've done. All of our good works outside of Christ are like filthy rags in His eyes. But listen to 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sake He became poor, so that you by His poverty might become rich. The Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead, the the one through whom the worlds were created, exalted God, with the Father, with the Holy Spirit, humbled Himself and came into this earth. And Philippians 2 says that though He was in the form of God, He emptied Himself by taking the form of a servant. He became poor so that He could die for us to make us rich in an eternal sense and to give us an eternal abode. Amen? Let us meditate on that as we think toward stewarding our wealth for the glory of God. Let me transition us to the table uh, with that thought. As John Mark said earlier, you know, Jesus rode into Jerusalem only to die just a few days later. And he laid his life down willfully for sinners. And he died with our shame and our filthy rags and our sin laid upon Him and He died in our place so that we could have eternal life and be clothed in His righteousness. And so if if you have received that good gift by faith and you have confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead and you have Uh, been baptized and made that public profession, uh, please come and enjoy uh, communion with us. And we will take that together. Uh, If not, uh, I would ask that you would refrain and just remain in your seat, but you can pray through the prayers. I believe they're in page one in your bulletin. Take some time to think upon these things. And when you're ready, come down the aisles and take the elements and return to your seats. And we will take the supper together. Let's pray. Oh, gracious Father, uh, we thank You for the sufficiency of Your Word. Lord, You have truly told us how to think about everything pertaining to life and godliness. And You have given us clear commands in Your Word on how to live in this world. And I pray, Lord, that as we go from this place, that all of us would steward the good gifts that You have given us for Your glory, for the advancement of the kingdom and the earth, and that we would do good We thank You, Lord, that You did the ultimate good and laid Your life down and became poor so that we would be made rich. We bless You, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.